QUT acknowledges the First Nations owners of the lands on where we gather today and pay our respects to the elders, laws, customs and creation spirits of this country. For thousands of years, the First Nations owners have gathered to share their knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and acknowledge the important role they play within our communities. We recognise their long and continuing connection to country, the lands, winds and waters throughout Australia. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, researching and learning. Hello everyone and welcome to another PCC for You Educator webinar. Um, it's lovely to see you all here with us today. We are coming to you from QUT in Brisbane or Mianjin, which is Turbal and Yagra country. And um, we'd love it if you could just introduce yourselves in the chat. And um, as you do that, just include the names of the, um, the traditional owners of the country that you're zooming in from today as well, so that we can all um, get to know those um, traditional lands. So it's lovely to see you all here. We'd like to welcome the, um, the team today. Um, we have Kylie uh, Ash, who is our National Program Manager. Linda Kanu is joining us as well. Uh, we have a guest uh, speaker today, Naomi Tatisi. Hi, Naomi. And um, Steph Dickinson is um, masked up and running the show. The rest of us have managed to secure private offices. So that's, we're explaining why we're not we're all wearing our masks today, um, or we're working from home. All right. So I might just um, hand over to Kylie now, who's going to be taking us through our topic presentation for today. Um, so welcome everyone. I just thought I'd give a little bit of a background and short overview of simulation and education just to set the scene today. Um, and really just to clarify what we're referring to today. So if I go up the next slide there, Sharon. Simulation, Jeffries is very famous in terms of her work with simulation and defines simulation as an event or situation made to resemble clinical practice as closely as possible. And when we're talking about simulation, the modality is quite an interesting concept. It's really referring to the type of simulation equipment or methodology used in simulation, such as a task trainer, standardized or simulated patient, full body mannequin or screen-based simulation. And the selection of that modality when planning an activity really depends on a number of factors, including the availability of equipment, stated objectives and the desired learning outcomes and resources and also cost is a, is quite a big factor and fidelity in simulation is that multi-dimensional concept which corresponds to, to the degree of realism that's created through the selection of simulation equipment setting in the scenario so a low simulation low fidelity simulation imitates an actual situation but sim simplifies the variables and you can see the example on screen i know when i was learning um, to do central line access chest to chest we use those in um, our clinical environments to practice central line accesses and the purpose of that low fidelity simulation is to turn a learned knowledge turned learned knowledge into a technical skill so it can be both hands-on or computer or text based scenarios. And by removing some of those factors that can be present in real life situations, students can better understand and practice more discrete concepts or skills. High fidelity, on the other hand, uses provides a most more realistic experience. It's commonly using computer based mannequins, high fidelity, uh, sorry, simulated patients as well. And scenarios are often complex and give students opportunities to experience those high pressure situations. It may be perceived that there is a preference for higher levels of fidelity, judging it as more superior to lower levels. The evidence, however, doesn't support this overall contention finding. It depends on the level, what is the actual objective for the activity. And so all levels of fidelity can be beneficial when used appropriately. Next slide. 
So it'd be good now just to get an understanding, and I'll go to the next slide, Sharon. It'd be good to understand how our webinar participants are currently using simulation. And if I can, I'll just get Sharon to run another poll just to have a very brief overview or have, answer a couple questions around your current use of um, simulation. So just interested to understand, have you actually used simulation in which, which sort of context? So palliative care, non-palliative care or never? And then the types of simulation that you've actually used. So I'll just give you a moment to have a look at those. And so I guess what we're really looking at then, I'd love to have your, um, from your experience, what impact to, has simulation had on student learning? We'd love to hear your thoughts. So if you could use the annotate button now to write down your thoughts on the benefits of simulation that you've seen on student learning. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Helen's just popped that comment into the chat that it gives students an opportunity to experience areas of practice which are not consistently available in the workplace. Um, that may be actually quite a relevant concept in terms of palliative care where um, it has been challenging at times. I get the feedback that students are not always able to gain access to clinical um, placements in palliative care. So that's really good. And also perhaps it's a area that you may ne not necessarily want students to go into straight away. So it opens up opportunities for that skills development, you're right. And they can definitely, yes, there's another comment there that students are able to learn without fear of making mistakes in the simulation environment. And I think probably um, Naomi might speak to this and it really is around building confidence and building up the um, confidence of the students is just as important as the competency in the actual skill. And that is certainly, there has to be a safe environment. So that's some, that's great conversation there. These are certainly points that are reflected in the literature and it really it's saying that improves critical thinking, clinical reasoning skills and problem solving skills. And that's that point of without fear of causing harm to actual patients and also the students themselves. Um, further benefits include improving knowledge acquisition, promoting understanding and application of cognitive and psychomotor skills, bridging the gap between theory and practice, refining communication and technical skills in interdisciplinary teams. And most importantly, students tend to like it. This, there is some evidence that high, there is higher le learner satisfaction, which can then potentially enhance engagement and facilitate learning. So, but how does this all work then in the palliative care setting? 2014, Dr. Pauline Gillen undertook a review of the literature on end of life care simulation. The conclusion was that end of life simulation was, was a strong and viable pedagogical approach to learning for its positive effects on knowledge acquisition, communication skills, self-confidence, student satisfaction and level of engagement in learning. Psychological safety of students and costs though were highlighted as, as factors for considerations. And there were a number of key learnings that were found in the literature and that was that after the simulation, students, yes, they perceived an increased knowledge and confidence in providing end of life care, but this positive effect really relied on authenticity of those experiences. And students perceive, perceive that learning in a non-threatening, safe, controlled environment supported learning. And the hands-on experience allowed them to really synthesize the learning from previous Interesting, the use of students or actors portraying roles of other family members added complexity to simulation scenarios and, and increased that realism. And in a palliative care context, it also really reinforced the, that sort of holistic, culturally responsive care. Debrief is such an important part of the learning experience. And I'll, I'll only touch on the findings as reflective debrief is a topic of our guest speaker later. And the benefits of debriefing in a safe, non-judgmental, confidential environment were clearly identified and really having an opportunity to address and affirm feelings and responses related to providing end of life care, taking that time to reflect on their own experiences 
and feelings and also consideration of the feelings and responses of others was, was seen as important. Certainly aided in the understanding of content and facilitated therapeutic communication and reflective learning. Another finding from Pauline's work was that the research in this area is in its infancy, infancy. And even though this was piece of work was done in 2014, I think that statement still holds true that really there is a need for quality studies to really using reliable and va valid tools to demonstrate that simulation in this context is meeting the desired outcomes. So. Thanks, Sharon. So where does that then leave us with PCC for you? What do we have to, I guess, um, contribute to this space? And PCC for you provides a range of teaching resources to support simulation to develop the palliative care capabilities. The core modules include authentic case scenarios, including William with his colorectal cancer, Michelle and her family managing breast cancer, Herbert's experience with heart failure and Bob living with motor neurone disease. The focus topics further explore care in specific populations and contexts. So you can explore multidisciplinary approach to care, looking at Betty who has chronic renal failure. Tom is an Aboriginal man with lung cancer. Emily is 10 and has a congenital heart defect. And Amy has early onset dementia and her case supports a focus on culture centred care. And each of those cases are following the person through a journey and they have their family on that journey as well. So there's quite a rich case that you can draw from and draw from um, for simulation experiences. We also have a specific simulation scenario module as well. And so I'll just very briefly um, touch on the option to utilize our online simulation scenario, which has proved quite useful when students are unable to attend face-to-face -face simulation. So I'll just go to the next slide there, Sharon. So the PCC for You simulation scenario e-learning modules are available on the learning management system, PCC for You um, Palliative Care Education LMS, and they follow the case scenario of Jeff Holder. That's a bit of information there. The focus of learning is on assessing and managing pain, communication, and working effectively within a team. And as you can see, there are specific learning outcomes which have been provided, and these can be adapted to your specific context or cohort of students as well. The educator version contains instructions with video and also videos with feedback, key points highlighted, and clinical documents that are required to implement and facilitate a palliative care simulated learning activity. A clear rubric of indicators is provided to guide simulation progression for students. And there's also videos which demonstrate examples of debrief. The student version includes videos, clinical documents and activity questions. And educators can direct students to access the e-learning module and undertake a critical reflection of the videos which meet or do not meet the objectives as a self-directed activity. Alternatively, an online facilitator can run an engaging and interactive session with students online, sharing elements of the resource, obtaining real-time feedback and discussions using the chat function. So that's a very brief summary of simulation and, and some of the PCC for you resources which you may want to use in your education. We now have a presentation by Linda Carnew describing the adaptation of some of these resources in a nursing program. So here at QUT within the Bachelor of Nursing course, final year students are offered the opportunity to complete a palliative care elective. The palliative care elective includes a wide range of essential learning to introduce and develop competency around delivering palliative care as graduate health professionals. My name is Linda Carnew and I had the privilege to co-facilitate some of the simulation sessions with Dr. Pauline Gillen, who created and coordinates the unit. So today I will be talking to you about how the pcc for uk case studies 
were utilised for clinical simulation learning. These are the desired learning outcomes for the palliative care elective unit. The four core pcc for you modules supported by case studies provide the structure for the web-based learning activities and are accompanied by teaching resources. Students participate in interactive web-based learning activities, reflections, discussion forums, and pre-readings to support face-to-face -face seminars. The clinical simulation learning outcomes feed directly into the final case study assessment piece. Students are also asked to complete the pcc for You workbooks as part of their self-directed learning. So in addition to week-by-week -week checkpoints, the palliative care elective unit includes two full-day face-to-face seminars. A lecture and tutorial workshop are used to deliver key concepts in the morning, and then the learning is consolidated in the afternoon simulation session. The pcc for You content and case studies have been extended into clinical simulations to explore and practice key concepts that were introduced as content and theory and small group work in the morning sessions. A funnel effect, if you like, to help students reach those key learning outcomes. So if you take all the content and learnings from the morning session and funnel them into an immersive and experiential learning situation where students are given the opportunity to fully participate and communicate with their best acting hats on to consolidate that newfound knowledge. The gold is when the students are achieving those light bulb moments, when the morning's classroom learning is put into practice and the effect is realized during the clinical simulation. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how this was achieved. During the morning session, students were introduced to pcc for use Michelle's story, where a number of video clips were played and small groups workshop the thinking points. So students already knew Michelle and understood just a little about her diagnosis and situation. They came to the sim prepared, they'd read the case notes and the pre-brief documents and the desired learning outcomes were all clearly outlined. They were given a short 10 minute pre-brief and handover and then commenced the 30 minute simulation Four students acted as community clinicians, while four students remained silently in the room as observers. The facilitator introduced Michelle to the students as she entered the clinic. The students commenced their assessment and interaction with Michelle. So just briefly, Michelle, a 38-year-old woman, was diagnosed two years ago with breast cancer. She arrives to the clinic for her appointment with the palliative care CNC. The scene is set. Michelle is returning to the clinic this afternoon for follow-up of her symptoms. As part of her visit today, we need to find out if the strategies we gave her last week have been effective in reducing her symptoms of lethargy, breathlessness and appetite loss. Can you think of any suggestions that may be useful for Michelle to implement at home? So that question was posed to the students. This clinical simulation enabled the community health students to meet Michelle and address her concerns. It was a beautiful thing to listen as students develop rapport, encourage Michelle to voice and share her concerns and receive real strategies and care that was based on palliative care principles. So some of the key areas of learning that this sim session included, the students were able to demonstrate empathy, clear, open, person-centered communication, and it felt like a safe place to do this. Symptom assessment and management, including nutritional support and strategies for addressing loss of appetite. Symptom management, including strategies for fatigue and nausea. There were referrals and roles of the interprofessional team explored and psychosocial support in palliative care. We noticed that while there were a lot of similarities in the approach and assessment of Michelle, no two groups reacted exactly the same. There were little tweaks and nuances to every discussion. There's a real benefit in enabling the situation or the simulation to go where the learning needs are. 
we were facilitators only. The community health students were driving the discussion. They were practicing open communication, listening, developing that therapeutic relationship and critically thinking out loud, demonstrating empathy, genuinely wanting to provide support within a shared team approach. The Michelle actor was a colleague who was also familiar with the case study and the key learning areas. So sometimes that helped to pull it back on track a little. At the end of the SIM, students provided a handover back to the CNC of the key points and the strategies that they had provided to Michelle. The debrief closed the session and included students' own reflection on the key learning areas. They spoke very freely about areas where they learnt the most. Observers added valuable feedback and insights as well. So the day two seminar, which was approximately three weeks after the first seminar, again, the learning began with a series of pre-readings, lecture content and small group workshops in the morning where pcc for us Williams story was introduced, followed by an afternoon clinical simulation session. And that was an adaptation of pcc for us Williams story. Once again, the students came prepared for the simulation. They'd completed the pre-brief case note readings. They had a 10 minute pre-brief and handover prior to commencing the 30 minute simulation. The learning outcomes and the focus of the activity were clearly defined once again. In this case, it was around holistic symptom assessment, communicating with the patient with a life limiting illness, listening and responding to and addressing patient needs. Once again, four students acted as clinicians, while four students remained silently in the room as observers. The facilitator provided a bedside handover and introduced William to the students. The scene was set. Bill William has been in hospital for two days now, following admission for unmanaged pain and other symptoms. He reports a pain score of seven out of 10 in his upper right quadrant, et cetera, et cetera. The students began immediately communicating, assessing and managing William's pain and symptoms, as well as practicing teamwork, communication and delegation skills by appointing a team leader. So some of the key learning areas that students got out of this sim included that opportunity again to practice and develop empathy and compassion through open, clear and respectful communication. They practice symptom assess, assessment and management, including pain, nausea, and constipation. There's an awareness of person-centered goals and specifically related to symptom management. Because in William's case, he was very concerned about drowsiness and potential effects of medications. So students were able to meet that nuance. Teamwork was evident, was very evident, and the recognition of the importance of referrals and the roles of the interprofessional team, for example, the pain team, nutrition and dietetics, and social worker were once again explored. The debrief session provided valuable insight into where the learning took them. The students provided a handover back to the, uh, the facilitator. And then they spoke very freely once again about their own individual knowledge gaps. The observers added valuable insights as well. Once again, no two groups reacted exactly the same, though all commanded a good understanding of the palliative care principles to guide their simulated clinical practice. So to sum up really some of the key findings from the, these clinical simulation sessions, these were truly the light bulb moments for the students. They mentioned how important it is to be person-centred and truly listen to the needs, really see the person, not the diagnosis, and try to enter into their experience. There was a greater understanding of situational uncertainty, including the uncertainty of about illness trajectory. And how must it feel? How must it really feel to have a life-limiting illness? There was a greater understanding of the complexity and the confronting nature for patients facing end of life. Students mentioned the realisation that often our patients are dealing with death and dying and we sometimes forget that so easily, too easily, when focused on tasks in the moment and symptom management. 
Some students commented how real and emotionally confronting it felt and wondered if Michelle and William were actually patients rather than role play. The learning outcome of evaluating their own self-care was highlighted through this discussion and how important it is to check ourselves emotionally and remain in tune to the stresses that health professionals face when caring for patients and their families at end of life. Students highlighted the importance of really knowing the roles of the interprofessional care team. Who can help and when is it timely to refer? They mentioned taking time to listen and how real the experience felt from doing the simulations. Some highlights for facilitators using the PCC for You resources for simulation included the versatility of the PCC for You resources. They're so adaptable for classroom setting, lectures, workshops, role play, and they truly consolidate the learning with these immersive simulation scenarios. All PCC for You case studies can be adapted and extended to address specific learning needs by fabricating extensions to the existing case studies that are already there on the PCC for You website. Educators can create discipline specific scenarios by adjusting the focus of learning. That can be used to base assessment and reflection essay questions on. PCC for You case studies can be used to accentuate the roles of interprofessional care and referral pathways. For example, I mentioned some, some of these already. In Michelle's story simulation, it evoked the need for interprofessional input from nutrition and dietetics, social worker, also OT and psych. And William's story simulation highlighted the value of referrals to nutrition and dietetics also, the pain team, medical team, and the community palliative care team. All of these came out of the simulation sessions that the, the students brought up themselves. So that wraps up this exemplar of adapting the PCC for You resources to facilitate an effective clinical simulation experience for our undergraduate health professionals. Thank you very much. Thanks, that was a great um, summary by Linda. Thank you very much for that. Linda, I might just start, did, how did you manage student wellbeing it, um, in this context of care, but also were, were there any concerns and how, how did um, you go about managing those sort of concerns for student wellbeing? Um, good question. Uh, we really made it very clear, Kylie, um, Pauline had put on the PowerPoints and on the, the unit content a sentence about um, how normal it was that these were confronting subjects and provided counselling services and phone numbers. All of that is also throughout the PCC for You resources. So that, that's there um, from the get-go and that's for all students to access. But when they did it actually bring feedback up during the sim that they found it confronting then I think it was really important to to normalize that and and like enter into that with them and how valuable that was to learn but obviously if there was a student that was um upset we took them aside and privately spoke to them mm. so but uh, they definitely felt that they were immersed and they really felt that need to understand better how confronting these subjects were. It was really lovely. Excellent. We've, thanks, Linda. We just had a comment in the chat that um, Lise and her team uses the Jeff Holder case study for students. So that's fantastic. And the case study is incorporated into the assessment as well. So it's great to hear that it's being used. So that's good. What we might do is move on to our next speaker, if that's okay. We will have some time at the end of the um, end of the session hopefully where we can ask some further questions but happy to have them popped into the chat as we're going but I would now like to introduce Naomi Tutichi um, thank you very much Naomi welcome to um, our webinar I came across your um, paper um, optimizing reflective capacity of nursing students after high fidelity simulation in my you know investigating the literature for this presentation and I just thought it would be fantastic to hear um, some of your reflections today. So Naomi, would you like to tell us some of your background in teaching and learning and your interest in this topic? 
Sure. Thanks, Kylie, for having me and for PCC for you inviting me along. It's, it's actually a real thrill to be able to talk about this topic. Uh, you know, it clearly, um, it's, it's something I really um, enjoy. I'm very curious about this type of learning. Uh, and I think we're in a really exciting time where, where things are changing rapidly with simulation and we are sort of becoming more and more, um, uh, we're becoming more and more, we're adapting and we're changing things that were fairly um, standard process a while ago. But anyway, my, my background is I did a PhD in um, the context of simulation, but my focus and interest particularly is around reflective thinking, a very abstract concept that I was really keen to try and quantify. So part of that project was designing a tool to measure reflective thinking and try and give it some numbers and also to sort of capture another a, a range of other um, aspects of reflective thinking. So the, the project um, also delved into the capacity of students to facilitate simulation debrief. So I ran a, a three-arm trial. I compared facilitator-led debrief, student-led debrief, and student and facilitator-led debrief in collaboration. Very interesting to watch that unfold. Part of the study was also looking at learning styles within simulation associated with different debrief, uh, different debrief styles. Uh, I was also looking at um, identifying facilitation styles particularly as well. So a lot of data came out of it. Um, if anyone is interested, I can, I can sort of give you the, the reference for the relevant paper that came out of that. Um, but sort of what I found from that is it is very difficult to quantify. Um, there's more work that needs to be done in this area so that we can sort of really say someone is at that high level of reflective thinking. So, you know, there's different ways of looking at reflecting thinking, but essentially it's sort of over, um, it's a hierarchy and you start at that very sort of reporting level of, of um, reflection. So you can recount what happened. Um, and then at the absolute end, end of that continuum is that critical reflection where you're really aware of what's going on internally but also externally as well what are what are the factors that are driving your decisions and your thinking and so that's really what my argument is is that as practitioners that's where we need to be moving towards that critical level of thinking and reflective thinking um, so from that phd came further studies I, with a group of researchers at um, QUT, we started to look at clinical reasoning because, as you can imagine, they have a very nice companion or uh, association. So we started to look at using Levitt-Jones model of clinical cycle. We are then um, we've published um, the pilot study where we looked at particularly the observer role in simulation and. In the literature, they talk about observer role as either being passive or could be more actively engaged in the process. So our argument was, well, could we get, could we use a cognitive strategy such as clinical reasoning and use that as the strategy to get the observers more engaged in the actual simulation experience? Subsequent to that, we then having watched multiple simulations as part of PhD studies and other studies, we started to really notice um, anecdotally that facilitation was a really key aspect of simulation experience, but also particularly the debrief experience and the quality of reflection. And so we called it a bit like the Wild West. Um, there was a really um, range of, of approaches to both simulation design and also simulation facilitation of the debrief experience. So we we're really keen to sort of audit what we were doing within the school, which we did. And it confirmed some of our suspicions that really we need to do a lot more work around standardizing simulation practice against benchmarks against the Anaxal standards, and also look at facilitator training and also consider what the purpose of the debrief is and what whether it's actually something you need to include or not. And also looking at whether high fidelity simulation, which Kylie mentioned in the beginning, is actually the appropriate approach for what you're wanting to achieve. 
Um, so we've really sort of started to challenge some of our own practices um, and, and sort of go to the literature and, and start researching as well. The current study that's about to start on Monday <laughs> is, um, so we were really, really chuffed to receive a, a, a seeding grant from Rosemary Bryant Foundation to look at a different approach to simulation. It's, it's already been um, talked about and um, written about in the literature. It's called Rapid Cycle Deliberate Practice. And it came out of the States. Um, a medical officer, I can't remember her name at the moment, um, had developed this approach, particularly around skill mastery and looking at it came out of pediatric resuscitation. So it was really about making sure that clinicians could had mastered the skills required to resuscitate a person. And we then, of course, couldn't help ourselves and we started to tinker with it. And we are now testing a modified version of that starting Monday um, where we're looking at, we're taking elements of that approach. So quite different. So instead of having the simulation unfold, and the students direct and continue on in that simulation in an immersive perspective, um, experience, which is great, with no interaction between educator and students until the debrief. What we're trialing now and our early sort of testing is showing some interesting results is that the facilitator will be at the bedside. And as the students um, engage in the simulation, they're stopped, um, pause, reflect, micro debrief, identify what needs to be done to correctly proceed, taken back to the previous stop and repeat and cycle through until mastery is achieved. So, yeah, it's really exciting. I, I, I'm trying not to be biased. I'm going into the study. I've got to keep my excitement levels down. But... I think there's a place for this. And I think my message today is simulation, I've realised isn't a blunt instrument. It's something that is nuanced and you try and find the best fit for it. And we're really, really fortunate now that there, as um, Kylie, you said earlier, there's a whole range of typologies for simulation. So it's really sort of thinking intentionally at the design stage, what am I hoping to achieve and what simulation type is the best and don't be frightened to mix and match a bit as well. So for example, you know, you might use high fidelity, but at the end, if the intention is to actually instruct the students, then you have a tutorial at the end. Um, if your intention is to get them to reflect on that critical level, then you have a facilitated debrief um, rather than an instructional debrief, which is what we're finding is tending to happen. It's a one-way transfer often of knowledge, particularly if there's an assessment attachment, assessment attached debrief. The students, as we are, you know, they're focused on what do I need to know for the assessment? And so that then becomes a driving force in the discussion and it can really distract. Anyway, so that's where we're at now. That's where I'm at now. I'm, yeah, I'm moving to Griffith on Monday as well. <laughs> And you are very busy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> so look, um, I, I'm happy to, um, I know, Kylie, you've popped some questions up, so I'm happy to, to go. Yeah. If you'd like more information at this stage. Yeah, I might. I mean, you've definitely, you can, you've shown that you've got a very much a student-centred focus on, on all the work that you've been um, moving towards. It's really that student-centred, but really building on a, a very solid framework of educational theory, isn't it? So that's beautiful. What I, I guess I'm going to bring the conversation back around to some of that critical thinking and mm. because that's really a challenge to get students to get to that point. And I, you know, reflecting on your paper, some of the things that came through that, one of the comments was around critical thinking and reflection skills, obviously imperative to develop. Um, in your paper, you highlighted reflection fatigue, though. Could you describe a little bit what that is and what impact does that have on student learning? Yeah, so the literature actually talks about this as a phenomenon within um, reflection activities, but particularly um, because simulation uses reflection as a, as a you know, fairly standard tool to increase learning from the experience. 
And the literature talks about student fatigue with this. As soon as they hear reflection, it's like as soon as you hear go clean your room, it's like sign off. So yeah, there's a lot of overuse. I think it's that fatigue is from overuse of reflection. And it's just sort of as a, it's, um, and I'm generalizing here, and I hope I don't offend anyone because I'm talking to myself as much as anyone, is that it was sort of a default activity that was included. Let's put a reflective component in here, either accessible or non-accessible, because that's what we do because we're reflective practitioners. And the students sort of, you know, oh, groan, we've got a reflection to do. Um, we're not really interested. We'll write something because we have to. And so that's why the argument now is be really intentional. If the activity is about examination, deconstructing practice and reconstructing to improve, then use reflection. If the activity is about teaching explicit skills and knowledge and transfer of knowledge, then maybe don't have, if that's the primary outcome, use a different teaching and learning strategy. And that will help overcome that, that fatigue and switch off um, because really it's so important that when reflection's done, it's done in a quality way. And, and I suppose there are sneaky ways you can um, input reflective activities without calling them a reflection activity in your syllabus as well. So you can be a little bit devious as well and that may also offset that fatigue. And that's things like if people are having to give feedback for example, the feedback has a reflective component to it. So as a result of the reflection I've un undertaken, this is the feedback. And you can even scaffold that reflection. And then the end point of that feedback is, these are the suggestions that I have that are constructive. So there's, there's multiple ways that we can implement reflection and reflective thinking activities, not calling it that, but as I said, it's, it's really important that if the objective is to develop reflective practice, then we need to make sure that reflection is taught, modelled um, and used appropriately. It's not a one size fit all. Definitely. I think you've, you've certainly described the role of um, simulation in current education at the moment. So I might skip number two and just there is a quote within your paper, though, that I wonder if you could comment on. And that is debrief strategies are critical to optimising critical reflection. Yet much debrief practice tends towards instruction at the expense of student self-exploration and preparation for assessment at the cost of critical reflection. So the question then is, how can educators really improve that debrief process to make it a valuable experience? Yeah, so I think, again, it's about constructing a debrief experience that has reflection as its core or major outcome. Um, and so part of that is the actual facilitator themselves um, knows how to reflect and can teach those skills explicitly, um, scaffolds reflective thinking into um, the experience itself, provides directive feedback around when reflection is evidenced by the students. So when they're seeing a reflective um, comment and that um, you know, you acknowledge it as a reflection, but also what type of reflection. Um, so can you give me more? You're telling, you're recounting here, which is great, but can you tell me now about how that made you feel? Mm. When you're recounting, how did you feel? That's interesting. So you felt quite anxious at that point, did you? Okay. How would you then respond to that feeling of anxiety if you were doing it again? What strategies would you use? What does the literature recommend that when you're undertaking a, a you know an activity, clinical skill, engage, you know, encounter, what does the literature suggest that may help you? What have you observed in practice that you've seen has been an effective strategy? So again, it's it's building, it's building from just that sort of recount. Oh, I, I you know, they when you say to them, oh, and this is where the emotional processing is so important that has been mentioned already. So when they finish the simulation, it's not, okay, right, we've got objectives here. What do we learn? Tell me what you thought. Um, it's actually, before you even go there, the literature talks about stop, check in. How am I feeling now? Oh, I'm actually still quite stressed. The adrenaline, oh, it was terrible. No, no, how are you feeling? 
Oh, I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually really relieved. Oh, okay. Right. So allow for that emotional processing to occur because if they're feeling really amped still, there is no way cognition is going to occur. They're just going to sit there the whole time going, that was a disaster. <laughs> I was terrible and I had to do it in front of all my peers and what must they think of me? And you're here going, and now I think this is the most important thing we can learn. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. I'm dramatising. But as I say, it's just really important. So for reflective to be, reflection to be meaningful and relevant, we need to allow them to get over that sort of immediate response to the simulation experience, collect, check out, and then, and there's literature on checking in and checking out in simulation. Um, Lisa Bogosonian, sorry, Lisa um, Bogosonian has, I think, um, written about that check in, check out. So, um, sorry, Carly, I probably have I gone off point. No, no not at <laughs> all. No, Bring no, me no. back. <laughs> I think. I mean, reading your publication, I think you you very beautifully and succinctly have wrapped that up into seven very practical strategies. So I certainly would recommend to the audience yeah. to access that paper um, because you really have outlined on oh, there. Thanks, Sharon. Sharon was just going to share that. You've certainly um, outlined those very clearly mm. and provided um, very clear guidance at the different levels in terms of the role of the facilitator sorry the yeah for the faculty and design perspective the simulation f debrief and facilitator mm -hmm. perspective and then also mm -hmm. the student perspective and the clinical mm -hmm. practice as well um, so I think it's probably we may we won't have time to go through all of them but I think wow. yeah this yeah. is this was quite a um, practical and I think worthwhile mm -hmm. thing for educators to use. Can I just say, Kylie, so the manuscript has gone through so many iterations. It just about broke me <laughs> trying to get this thing going. I'm um, like most passion projects. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I need, you know, it needs to get out there. And, and you know, reviewer after reviewer is going, oh, it's very dry and academic. And eventually, that's why it ha I, I'm so much happier now because, and I went to a graphic artist to get some images to try and sort of, um, you know, visually um, yeah what's important around um, simulation but also as you said looking from the three aspects so when you're designing a simulation across these seven areas what do you need to be thinking about before you even get to that implementation stage because once it's there the horse is bolted you've spent all the money you've spent the hours so you really need to go back and then yeah I hope hopefully strategies for the facilitator themselves to um do these seven elements and then of course translation to practice from the student perspective so um yeah it it crammed into one a4 page <laughs> i'm certainly interested in people's if you do get a chance to read it um I, I really would love to have this developed further and and refined but i think it is really important that as you said it is actually about the students mm. and you no know, um just to finish off in terms of peers and um, um, like a collaborative approach, from my PhD study, I actually found that the student-led facilitators, when they facilitate a debrief, was probably technically the best reflective debriefs because they followed the script. Mm -hmm. Whereas when the when the facilitators facilitate a debrief, as I said, um, and like learning teaching styles are varied. But the impact was lost because often, you know, trajectories off, off topic, instruction, you know, and so it's interesting. So don't ever underestimate, yeah, the power of um, the peer or your or the um, student body. Yeah, I think that's that's really important um, feedback there. And I do, do, do we have any questions from people in the audience today or any comments? Um, you're more than welcome to unmute and, and pipe up and ask a question. Um, while we've got Naomi here, I think you've really, yeah, definitely added to the discussion and food for thought, certainly, on yeah. how we provide resources. No, that's been a, a fantastic um, presentation and um, Sharon we could probably just pop up the summary for now but we definitely thank you for your time today and I will acknowledge your um, title there I didn't in the introduction Dr Naomi Tutiti thank you very much for your time again
Um, so we will just wrap up in terms of some of those take home messages. I mean, certainly for me, I mean, simulation, I think we've um, in a way today identified or demonstrated how it, it can be used to increase the knowledge through authentic learning experiences and specifically in palliative care, their education, there is a role. Reflective debrief, absolutely critical to develop those critical thinking skills. And as we've seen, there's a range of um, teaching and learning theories and, and approaches that sit underneath that that really do warrant further consideration. And we really do need to do further re quality research to demonstrate that these processes are reaching student outcomes. And we certainly congratulate Naomi and her team for um, getting that grant to further this um, field of education. And we're certainly at PCC for you keen to partner with um, education providers to actually be able to provide some demonstration of the um, effectiveness of the resources that we're putting in place and the education that then is provided. Um, yes, we will be providing a copy. What we do with the education resources and the video and also the slides, we'll be able to have a copy of those in the learning management system. So you'll be able to go into the um, educator community um, webinar section of the learning management system. And when you scroll down, you'll see all of today's resources. So they'll be available. But thank you very much for your time. I'll hand over to Sharon now, who is the master of ceremonies. Thanks, Kylie, and thanks, Naomi and Linda. What a wonderful um, group of, of presentations today, and I think um, very passionate uh, people with regard to the, the um, involvement of simulation in learning. And um, I've certainly learned a lot um, sitting here listening as well. Quickly uh, end that poll. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.